This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Committed to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And you know something? I had an adventure tonight I wish you could have shared with me. I had a steak about, oh, an inch and a half thick, tender and juicy, and with it I had a glass of Petri California Burgundy. Now there's a combination. Steak and Petri Burgundy. That Petri Burgundy is a perfect mealtime wine. It's a rich red wine that's hearty and full of flavor, flavor that comes right from the heart of the grape. And don't think that Petri Burgundy is only good with steak. It'll make a hamburger sandwich taste like a feast, too. Try Petri Burgundy with any meat or meat dish. It's just wonderful. And serve it proudly, too, because after all, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I know Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You're quite muffled up tonight, I see. Overcoats, scarf, and gloves. Slip them off and come and join me by the fire. Thanks, Doctor. Quite a nip in the air tonight. Yes, there is indeed. Well, Doctor, you told us last week that tonight's story centered around the activities of a brilliant and beautiful woman. Yes, my boy. Her name was Irene Adler. But I never knew Holmes to refer to her by any other name than the woman. She sounds mighty intriguing. How did you happen to meet up with her? Well, I'll tell you the story from the beginning. One night, it was on the 20th of March, 1888, to be exact, I was returning home from a visit to a patient when my steps led me through Baker Street. Since my marriage, I hadn't seen much of Sherlock Holmes. And, and you uh, couldn't resist stopping by 221B, I'm sure, Doctor. Uh, of course I couldn't. As I stood outside the well-remembered door, I looked up at the lighted windows and saw the tall, spare figure of my old friend pass twice in dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk on his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was hot on the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell, and a few moments later, found myself standing before him. Marriage suits you, Watson. You look in splendid shape. Yes, I'm mm. feeling very well, eh? And in practice again, I see. You didn't tell me that you'd gone back into harness. Oh, how do you know? Elementary, my dear chap. If a gentleman walks into my rooms smelling of iodoform with a black mark of nitrate of silver on his right forefinger and a bulge on the left side of his hat to show where he has secreted his stethoscope, I should be dull indeed if I didn't pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. <laughs> Same as ever, Holmes. By the way, I'm... Uh... I'm not interrupting you, am I? Yes, you are, old fellow, but it's a, a most welcome interruption. You're working on a new case? It looks like it. This letter arrived by the last post today. It's undated and has neither signature nor address. Read it. Look, they will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight o'clock a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted. This account of you we have from all quarters received. <laughs> Be in your chamber then at that hour and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. Quick, Scott, it all sounds very mysterious. What do you imagine it means? Look carefully at the note, Watson. What do you deduce from it? Well, let's see. Well, the man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do. Such paper couldn't be bought for under half a crown a packet. And it's peculiarly strong and stiff. Peculiar. That's the very word. It's not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. You notice anything? Yes. There's a large E with a small G. Mm -hmm. 
and a large G with a small T woven into the texture of the paper. What does that suggest to you? The name of the maker, no doubt, or, or perhaps his monogram. Not at all, my dear fellow. The G <coughs> with a small T stands for Gesellschaft, which is the German for company. And the E-G? That stands for Igria. It's a German-speaking country in Bohemia, not far from Carlsbad. So the paper was made in Bohemia? Undoubtedly. The man who wrote the note is a German. Well, how do you know that? Observe the curious construction of the sentence. This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or a Russian could not have written that. It's the German who is so discourteous to his verbs. Oh, there's your current now. I, I'd better go home. No, 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 unless you have to. Well, I... Good stay. I thought Oh, then, my dear chap, stay by all means. I'm lost without my Boswell, and this promises to be interesting. Uh, I told Mrs. Hudson uh, to let the masked visitor come upstairs unannounced. Come in. Good evening, sir. You, uh, you received my note? Yes, indeed. Uh, come in, won't you? Sit down. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. You may say anything before him that you can say to me. Whom have I the honor to address? You may address me as uh, Count von Kram. How do you do, sir? You must excuse this mask that I wear. The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you. And I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly my own. I was well aware of that fact, sir. You see, Mr. Holmes, uh, uh, the matter uh, I'm about to discuss implicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of Bohemia. That had not escaped me either, sir. In fact, if you will state your case, I shall be better able to advise you. Your Majesty. Uh, how, how did you... Yes. Yes, I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed. I shall remove the mask. There. Mr. Holmes... I have traveled incognito from Prague for the express purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult. Briefly, the facts are these. Some five years ago, during a visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventuress, Irene Adler. Irene Adler? We know of her, Your Majesty. Now look her up in the index for me, will you, Watson? It's uh, right beside you on the desk there. I, I imagine that the name uh, would not be unfamiliar to you. Uh, here we are, here we are. A. Abrahams, Acton Green, Hatchet Murders, Adler, Adler. Splendid. Hand me the file, old chap. Thank uh. you. Mm hmm. Adeline Adler. Born in New Jersey in the United States of America in 1858. Contralto. Mm hmm. Prima Donna, Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Oh. Retired from our operatic stage. Living in London. Quite so. And uh, here's a recent notation. Uh huh. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so, but how. Uh, was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or, or certificates? Uh, no. Then I fail to follow your majesty. If this young lady should uh, produce her letters for blackmailing purposes, how she'd prove their authenticity? There's the handwriting. That could be a forgery, your majesty. But it was private note paper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. What? We were bought in the photograph. Oh, dear me. Yes, that's very bad. Uh, your majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. Did you inscribe this photograph, your majesty? Yes, Dr. Watson, I am afraid I did. Good gracious me. Mr. Holmes, it must be recovered. Uh, perhaps if you were to pay enough, the photograph might be bought. She refuses to sell. Stolen, then. Five attempts have been made. Twice, burglars in my pay ransacked our house. Once, we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice, she has been waylaid. There has been no result. Well, there is quite a pretty little problem. Uh, it is a deadly serious one to me. Your Majesty, what does Miss Adler intend to do with the photograph? To ruin me. Now, how, sir? Well, I am about to be married to the second daughter of the king of Scandinavia. She is the soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. And um, Irene Adler threatens to send the photograph to your fiancée, I suppose. Yes, and she will do it. Rather than let me marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go. None. Uh, are you sure that she hasn't already sent it to your majesty? I am sure. And why? She said she would send it on the day my betrothal is uh, publicly announced. That day 
It'll be next Monday. Splendid. Then we still have uh, three days. Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present? Yes, certainly. Uh, you mm. will find me at the Langham Hotel, registered as Sir Count von Kram. Uh, just two questions before you leave. What are they? Is the photograph large or small? Quite large. And uh, it was in a heavy frame. I see. And what is um, Irene Adler's London address, please? Uh, Brienne Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Thank you, Your Majesty. Good night, and I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. I am placing all my hopes in you, Mr. Holmes. Good night. Good night, Dr. Morris. Good night, Your Majesty. Fascinating problem, Holmes. I wish I could help you with it. You can, my dear chap. I shall be glad of your company. That's our first move, Holmes. A good night's rest. We'll meet here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then? Then, my dear fellow, we will see what we can find out about Miss Irene Adler, late of the Warsaw Imperial Opera Company, and at present residing at Bryony Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Cursory examination of Brownlee Lodge didn't prove very illuminating. No, a bijou residence <clears throat> that represents the essence of dignified suburbia. But tells us very little about the owner. I think a visit to the local public house might prove more instructive. Come on, old chap. I see the door of the coach and horses inviting us from across the road. Well, our disguises shouldn't <clears throat> cause any suspicion. No? Well, I suggested them. In the character of a couple of stable. I felt that we might inspire confidence. This is a horsey neighborhood. And there's a wonderful sympathy and Freemasonry among that fraternity. There we are. Better let me do most of the talking. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sure that your accent will be more convincing than mine. Let's go in, shall we? <laughs> well, <laughs> worry me, mateys. Off of Baltimore, please. How about you, Charlie? All over the same. <laughs> Two uh, half of uh, old and mild. <laughs> Here we are, mateys. That'll be a tenner. Have a drink with us, Governor? <laughs> Boy, don't mind if I do. I'll have a Guinness. <laughs> You blokes uh, new around here? Oh, yes, we had just come over from Clapham. Clapham, eh? <laughs> well, he's looking at you. <coughs> Are you uh, hunting for jobs? Yes, that's right. Well, we was told that Miss Adler, of course, at Bryony Lodge, uh, needed a new coachman and groom. Well, it's the first I've heard of it. But it uh, might be true. Uh, have you been over there to ask? No, not yet. We thought we'd find out something about the old girl first. <laughs> She ain't no old girl, matey. <laughs> She's the prettiest young thing you ever saw under a bonnet, and that's a fact. <laughs> you know her, Governor? Yeah, of course I know her. Used to drive a carriage, I did, before I come to work here. Oh, what's she like? Well, nice little lady as you'll find, chum. Work yard? No, no, no. <clears throat> she lives there, quiet like. Goes out singing at concerts once in a while. Rest of the time, it's money for jam. She goes out for a drive in the park every day at five and comes back to dinner at 6.30. Rest of the time, she arrives. Oh, she ain't managed to say. No, no. Uh, uh, but she's got a bloke watch that <laughs> comes to see her all the time. He's a barrister. Nice gentleman. Mr. Jeffrey Norton is his name. Oh, yeah. Good-looking fella. Wouldn't be surprised to see him get sliced. Huh. Sounds like a nice cushy job to me. Come on, Charlie. Let's get over to the house and see what's what. Much obliged to you, Matt Jump. Well, <laughs> good luck, matey. Good night. And, and thanks for the guineas. <laughs> what, what's our next move, Holmes? Let's draw back to Brownie Lodge, shall we? I'm undecided whether to continue my investigations there or to try and find out something about Mr. Geoffrey Norton, the barrister. If he is just her lawyer and nothing else, it's more than likely that she's entrusted the photograph to his safekeeping. Hello. Cab waiting outside Miss Adler's house. Harry Watson, maybe Mr. Norton's. Here we are at the gate. Yes. And here comes a man hurrying down the pathway. Quick. Hide this post. Listen. Where to now, Mr. Norton? Try like the devil. First to Gross and Hankey's in Regent Street, and then to the church of St. Monica in the Edgeware Road. Half a sovereign if you do it in 20 minutes. Right you are, Mr. Norton. Off in. 
time signal the cab, Watson. We must follow him. Here comes one. No, 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 it isn't it. It's, it's a private carriage. Miss Arthur's, no doubt. Oh, well, here she comes down the pathway. Back again behind the post, Watson. Where to, Miss Adler? To the Church of St. Monica, John, and half a sovereign if you reach it in 20 minutes. Came to foot. Quick. We must get a cab and follow them. Here comes a handsome. Cabby. Hi, hi, cabby. Have you both got enough money to take a cab? Here's half a sovereign for you, my man. Right you are. Where to, Governor? The Church of St. Monica on the Edgeway Road. And another half sovereign for you if you get us there in 20 minutes. <laughs> We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, but let me tell you something. If you're going to have chicken for dinner tomorrow night, or, or any night, don't forget to serve that chicken with Petri California Sauterne. Believe me, Petri Sauterne is just about the last word in white wine. It's beautifully golden in color, it's delicate and intriguing in flavor, and it's just... Well, you taste it and see for yourself. If you want a delicious white wine, you certainly want Petri Sauter. The doctor, again, you broke off your story at the most exciting point. Did you and Sherlock Holmes reach that church inside the 20 minutes? Yes, Mr. Bartell, we did, but the other carriages were there before us. Holmes went into the church after telling me to guard the outside. I must have waited for ten minutes or more before Mr. Jeffrey Norton and Miss Adler came out. Spoke a few words to each other and then left then in their, in their separate conveyances. A moment later, Holmes, still dressed as a stable hand, came striding out of the church and down the steps towards me. He was obviously very excited. Watson. Watson, have they left? Yes, in, in separate cabs. I overheard him say that he was going back to his office. And she said, I shall drive out in the park at five o'clock as usual. Splendid. And come on. We can return to Big Street. What, what happened inside the church, Holmes? <laughs> they were married. Married? Of course. The ceremony would have been illegal if performed afternoon. That accounted for their wild dash to the church. Jump into the cab, old fellow. Where to now, Governor? 221 B Baker Street. Oh, so, so they got married, eh? Yes, and uh, it may amuse you to know that I acted as witness at the ceremony. You did, but how did that happen? <laughs> Their own witness had failed to appear, and I was dragged into the breach. The uh, bride gave me this sovereign as a memento. I uh, think I'll wear it on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. What an amazing situation. Things begin to look better for the king, don't they? Now that she's Mrs. Norton, the chances are that she won't want to expose his majesty after all. I hope so, Watson, I hope so. But we can't afford to take any chances. I think the time is ripe for us to come to closer grips with the lady. <laughs> Well, Holmes, now that we've eaten, perhaps you'll tell me your plan. With pleasure, my dear fellow. And while I'm so doing, I'll proceed with uh, applying the makeup of my new disguise. Another disguise? <laughs> What's it to be this well, I think time? the character and appearance of an amiable, simple-minded, nonconformist clergyman would be the most suited to my plan for entering Miss Adler's house. You're going to try and enter, then? I must, my dear fellow. I'm sure the photograph is there. Miss Adler, or rather, Mrs. Norton, who will return from her drive in the park at 6.30. We must be at Briony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I've already made my arrangements. There is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may, you understand? I'm to remain neutral. Yes. There will be uh, some small unpleasantness. Don't join in. It will end in my being conveyed into the house. As soon as I'm able to, I shall open one of the windows. You are to watch from the outside. When I raise my hand, you will throw an object that I shall give you through the window and at the same time cry fire. You follow me? Entirely, but what am I to throw? Oh, it's nothing very formidable. Here it is. Huh. Looks like a great big cigar. Just what an is it? ordinary plumber smoke rocket. Fit it with a cap at either end to make itself lighting. Your task is confined to throwing it through the window. When you raise the cry of fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. You may then walk to the end of the street, and I'll rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope I've made myself clear. Perfectly. Good. And now, old fellow, as soon as I've drawn my clerical attire, let's be on our way. There's no time to be lost. <laughs> It's 6 30, Holmes. We've been pacing up and down in front of her house for half an hour now. I hope she does come back. I'm sure she will. There seem to be a lot of loafers hanging around her gate. All part of my conspiracy, old chap. 
You'll see them play their parts in a few minutes. You still think the photograph is inside the house? Yes, it's uh, most unlikely that she carries it about with her. Remember, the king told us it was a large frame picture. And also remember that she'd planned to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands on it. It must be inside her house. But her house has been burgled oh, twice. They didn't know how to look. How, how will you look? I won't. I'll get her to show me. Oh, she'll refuse. She won't be able to... Shh. There comes the carriage now. Remember, Watson, carry out my orders to the letter. You can trust me. Good luck. Blimey, here comes the Duchess of Tiddly. <laughs> Let's put out a carpet. She might get her tootsies wet. Oh, put a sock in it, Elfie. Leave him alone. She's no better than she ought to be. Please, please, let, let me do. I live here. Well, ain't that nice? We'll all come in and have a cup of cat <laughs> Move out of the way, please, and let the lady through. Mind your own business. Just because your collar's turned the wrong way round, you can't spoil our fun. Uh, That's right, Eddie. Keep your nose out of it, Parson. <laughs> Yeah. Please, please don't fight about it. No, no I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I can... Yeah, stop yeah. molesting the lady, please. Do you? Then how would you like a biff on the nose? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, he hit the poor man, and then he ran away, the coward. Is the clergyman badly hurt? He hit his head, Mum, as he fell. If you ask me, he's that bad. He's bleeding something terrible. Can we bring him in, Mum? He can't lie here in the street. Oh, why, of course. Bring him in. Right you are, Mum. Here, Bert. Right, Anne. Give us a hand. Oh. 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 Coo, poor fella. Did you see what happened to him, mister? Yes, I saw, my good woman. A very convincing demonstration. What you mean? Weren't you paid by, uh, by a certain gentleman for this performance? Oh, you know about it, too. Huh. You must be a friend of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, I am. Oh, nice gentleman. He give us five bob a piece for tonight's work. We ain't through yet, though. We've got to start yelling fire when somebody tells us. I'm that somebody, my dear lady. There's Mr. Holmes now. He's, he's inside the house. Yes, he's opening a window. Now he's raising his hand. That's my signal. Now to throw the rocket. Ah, there we are. Fire! Fire! Holmes, there you are. You, you have the photograph? No, but I know where it is. She showed me as I told you she would. Well, I'm still in the dark. There's no mystery, old chap. When my accomplices started the round the street, I had a little moist red paint in my hand. My good friend Alfred pretended to strike me. I clapped my hand to my head and fell down. It's an old trick. Yes, I understand that. But how did my throwing the rocket help it you? It's all important, my dear fellow. When a woman thinks her house is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush for the thing that she values most. A married one gra grabs her baby. An unmarried one reaches for a jewel box. In this case, of course, it was the photograph. Well, where was it? In a recess in the living room, just above the right-hand bell pole. I caught a glimpse of it as she drew it out. When I made it known that the father was a false alarm, she replaced the photograph. As soon as I was able to, I advised her that I was feeling well enough to leave. You didn't take the photograph, then? No, I felt that over-precipitance at this stage might ruin everything. Well, what do we do now? Drive to the Langham Hotel and inform His Majesty of what has happened. Then return with him here. After that, my dear chap, the case will be ended. This is Barney Lodge, Your Majesty. Ash, I'm all impatience. You are certain the photograph will still be there, Mr. Holmes? I have every reason to believe so, Your Majesty. Mm, I, I must confess this is going to be something of an ordeal. Then I suggest that you let me do the talking, Your Majesty. I think I know how to handle the lady. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I believe. Yes. I am Mr. Holmes, but uh, how did you know? My mistress told me you would be likely to call. She's left for the continent with her husband. You mean she's left England? Never to return. Oh, then the papers and the photograph. Oh, all is lost. We'll soon see. Follow me. He said you'd be looking for something. I hope you'll find it. This was the rope. There's a sliding panel behind it. Uh-huh. Here it is. It's, uh, it's the photograph there, Mr. Holmes. Uh, there is a photograph, Your Majesty, but it's, um, 
A photograph of the lady alone. Here's a letter, and it's addressed to me. What does it say, Holmes? My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. Until after the fire alarm, I had no suspicion. But then when I realized how I had betrayed myself, I began to think. I'd been warned that if the king employed an agent, he would certainly employ you. May I congratulate you on your disguise as a dear old clergyman? Oh, it's got you. It's much more clever than you thought, Holmes. Yeah, yeah, go on. What else does it say? Uh, <clears throat> and my husband and I both thought that the best recourse was flight. So you will find the nest empty. As to the photograph of the king and myself, his majesty may rest in peace. Oh, thank goodness for that. I love and am loved by a better man than he. I leave another photograph, however, that he might care to possess. And I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay Adler. What a woman, Watson. What a woman. What a magnificent woman. She fooled me completely. But, oh, I, uh, I'm sorry, Your Majesty. I, I've been unable to bring your business to a more successful conclusion. On the contrary, my dear sir, nothing could be more successful. I know that Irene's world is inviolate. The incriminating photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. Well, I'm glad to hear Your Majesty say so. Mm, I'm immensely indebted to you. Pray tell me, in what way I can reward you? Uh, this, uh, this barrel ring that I wear, I, I should be proud Your to... Majesty has um, something that I should value even more highly. You have but to name it. Uh, this photograph, sir. Irene's photograph? But certainly. However, you must let me give you something more substantial. No, 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 no Your Majesty. This, uh, uh, this is something I shall treasure all my life. This and a golden sovereign I received from the lady's hand. They will remind me that I was once tricked by a woman... A woman that I shall never forget. Gee, Doctor, what a woman, that Mrs. Adler. Or should I say Mrs. Norton. Ah, that's the kind of woman I could really go for. Yeah, I believe you could. Just between ourselves, you know, I sort of, <clears throat> sort of uh, could uh, go for her myself. <laughs> she was intelligent. She was rich. And beautiful. That's the kind of woman you want sitting next to you in front of a cozy fire on a nippy fall night. Just the three of you. The three of you? Mm-hmm. You, she, and a glass of Petri Port. <laughs> Mr. Bartell. Well, why not? Oh, <laughs> Petri California Port is some wine. Boy, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine, all right. And no wonder. Look at all the experience they've had. Ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s, the Petri family has handed down from father to son, from father to son, the art of selecting perfect, sun-ripened California grapes and making them into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. Those letters, P-E-T-R-I, on the label of every bottle of Petri wine are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. It's got to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, that was a great story you told us tonight. Well, I thought you'd like it, Mr. Bartell. That's why I plan to tell you a sequel to it next week. A sequel? Say, that sounds exciting, Doctor. Well, I think you'll find it proves to be, Mr. Bartell. It's a story that takes place 20 years after tonight's adventure. Once again, the principal part is played by a woman. Only in this case, it isn't Irene Adler. It's her daughter. Oh, and uh, now, Mr. Bartell, before I go, I want to remind our listeners that they owe a real debt of gratitude to the selective service boards in their communities. At this moment, those selective service boards are working harder than ever, making sure that every returning veteran knows his rights and privileges. And the boards are helping him take full advantage of those rights and privileges. And they're helping our veterans get jobs. Our selective service boards deserve our sincere thanks and they deserve our cooperation. They have done and they are doing a splendid job. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is an adaptation of the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Music is by Dean Fossler. 
Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Bulldog Drummond, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.